Sinai for 15 years. Uh, and he's a heavily involved for ACGME program, uh, AUR. So the big thing about education, and he loved mentoring students. So I get to see her uh, mentor, a mentee uh, through some radio society, but he always take care of people. So that's what I love about Nolan. Uh, the other things about uh, EDI, he's a huge advocate for diversity, equity, inclusion, and he is the uh, upcoming co-chair for later, something called uh, Leader Advocating in uh, Diversity Inclusion in Radiology, which is a part of the uh, AUR program. So advocacy work, all of that. And also he is the council steering committee in ACR. So that's something that you have to apply and if people have to vote it and get selected. So he is now uh, a CSC steering committee member. So again, ACI does a lot of policy work, advocacy work. So this is a huge deal that he contributes. And then most importantly, uh, his impressive uh, part of that is he has a 16,000 follower on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> you can call the as a radiology practicing you know, radiologist. It's a, it's a 16,000 people following you. That means that people love him. People just love to hear what he says. So every time he tweets something, I got notification. No, like I get to tweet it there. So like, okay, like I have to go and check. But he used that, the Twitter as a uh, the way to recruit people and outreach. So he get invited from all over the country, like, uh, I don't know, Southeast Asia, uh, Europe, everywhere because of his presence in a social media. So today, we are very fortunate to have him talking about beyond unconscious bias and microaggression, being an ally and upstander. So please, welcome. Thank you for that wonderful invitation. Thank you, uh, Dr. Minoshima, for the invite. Yeah, let's go. I'm a recovering program director. <laughs> I actually got out of the business pre-pandemic, which was in retrospect this morning. Um, let's start with an exercise called square breathing. Some of you may know this. Does any, the, oh, that the other day. You, you do it? Okay, so this will be review for some. And so uh, everyone, I'll model this. Sit at the edge of your chair like you're a small child about to receive a present. Very excited. <laughs> sit with your back straight with, and sit with dignity, right? Sometimes I think radiologists need practice sitting with dignity just weird. Sometimes, you know, sometimes our colleagues don't necessarily treat us with dignity, that, the dignity that I think we all deserve. So sit with dignity, maybe put your hands on, on your uh, knees, and then uh, with whatever the white thing says, try to do that. So breathe in, hold, breathe out, and Next level would be breathe in through your nose. First your lips and as if you're blowing out through a straw. And uh, you can keep doing that and I'll keep talking. I learned about this square breathing or box breathing. Uh, I was at a session at the fire department of the city of New York, and they actually teach the firefighters that if you're in a stressful situation, try this. I figured if they should know something about stress. Although I did have an applicant apply to radiology. Stress. <laughs> that was really bad at this. <laughs> So I'm required to do disclosure of commercial interest. So my wife works for Pfizer. I jokingly say she's in charge of the microchip program. CEO of Sati Pads. Please feel free to. I'm a board advisor. These are kind of unpaid, so there's just more bright, I think. Advisor for LinkedIn inclusion, 
Uh, use my outside, outside voice. voice. Outside <laughs> voice. Okay, and I'm an advisor for ACGME, uh, uh, off of their office of DEI. So one of my colleagues actually asked me, why do you care about diversity? And it's, what is your why? So I was kind of thinking about it. I didn't, like many times, we were asked questions. I kind of thought of a good answer a few days later. <laughs> that was terrible for me on medicine rounds. <laughs> Something like that. So anyways, it probably goes back to mom. My mom was born in British Columbia back in 1929. At age six, she moved to Ocean Falls, British Columbia. Her father uh, was a laborer in a, a local lumber mill, paper mill. And she actually lived in a segregated community that the locals called Jap Town. And uh, we actually went back in 19, 2019 to visit Ocean Falls. Um, it's about 290 miles north. Um, so back in those days, what was it like? Well, there actually was an interesting uh, movie star, I think maybe silent movies in the 1910s, Sasue Hayakawa. And yet even then there was a backlash. There was a organization back in the day called the Hollywood Protective Association that wanted to keep Hollywood white. And uh, they had these proudly posted signs like this. And so it, when World War II came along, they had internment in the US and in Canada. And so my mom was, uh, whatever, gathered from Ocean Falls and to Vancouver. And uh, they, this building still stands. It's a livestock building at Hastings Park. And that's what it looked like on the, the black and white is what it looked like back then. And we went back to visit in 1993 and they reconverted it into a stable. It was a stable, but my mom told the story that you know, she was in one of these uh, makeshift spaces and her pillow rolled off her bed into the trough where they have the horse or animal waste and she decided not to sleep with her pillow that day. Anyways, so after camp, after the camps closed in Canada, they were actually more harsh than the US because in Canada, they said, we don't want you back in Vancouver. Your option is to go to Japan, or to uh, east of the Rockies. So their one of their first stops was uh, Alberta. And uh, she worked in a, her father worked in a sugar beet farm and it was described as a job so unpleasant and arduous that many German POWs refused to do, do that work. Uh, ultimately, she became a teacher in Ontario. And uh, at, at one point, they, not, she had a baby sister that died in uh, Ocean Falls and they went to recover the remains of the sister. And then later on, that cemetery was paved over to become a seaplane landing. Anyways, let's go to the learning objectives. So these are some of our learning objectives, talk about unconscious bias, microaggressions, and being an ally, upstander. And then in some ways, uh, if we, these are kind of softball objectives, and uh, this is kind of a funny cartoon. Uh, no one even wants to acknowledge me or even say the word. So we're gonna say the word, uh, we'll say two words actually, stru structural racism um, and talk about being anti-racist. And somebody, uh, I gave this a version of this talk earlier and somebody said one of the big things we need to talk about is sexism. So the <coughs> elephants, elephants in the room. Let's start with some glossary terms. Um, on the ACR, ACR DEI page and so I'm, co-author of a glossary, because sometimes when you talk about this work, some people said, wow, there's so many terms, what do they all mean? And so these are some of the starter terms, stereotypes, oversimplified generalizations about groups of people. Uh, prejudice is prejudgment about a group. For example, xenophobia, fear of uh, prejudging 
foreigners. Discrimination would be actions based on prejudice. And then racism would be prejudice, discrimination, or antagonism directed against someone of a different race based on the belief that one's own race is superior. All right, so actually my, my uh, kid went, majored in sociology and taught me this term back in the day or whatever, some years ago. And I thought it was very eye-opening because no one wants to say who is racist and no one is going to raise their hand, right? But in some ways, many of us, or probably perhaps all of us, are structurally racist in the terms of... So structural racism is that you as an individual can be totally unbiased. However, we live in a system in which the uh, that perpetuates inequity. So one of the kind of uh, books I read uh, talked about how drug laws penalize pharmacologically equivalent doses of crack versus powder cocaine differently, and this how this adversely affects minority uh, communities. So that was kind of one recent examples of structural racism. Um, and then there's examples throughout the years. Uh, the initial version of the Constitution had three fifths rule, where we're probably familiar with all, quote, all others, meaning. Uh, <laughs> and in 1942, we are uh, that was Executive Order 9066, and uh, it never really mentioned the word. It actually had language that authorized the Secretary of War to prescribe military areas. But kind of between the lines, that's what happened. They, they did a tournament. And so, recently in 2017, we had the Executive Order 13769, uh, effectively you know, the Muslim ban. It, that also didn't specifically mention Muslims, but it did couch things in terms of protecting the nation from foreign terrorist entry into the United States. Um, there's some um, things that you might be aware of, redlining, uh, gerrymandering, voter suppression, and people have written about um, some examples of structural or systemic racism. So some time ago, I read this book, Ibram Kendi. Um, he talks about being racist. He kind of breaks down racist, non-racist, and anti-racist. Um, so racist, people will say, well, I don't belong to the KKK. I'm not racist. And um, he says, in some ways, not racist probably is perhaps not good enough. He says the heart, heartbeat of uh, racism is denial. Um, and we can, if you want, we can talk about later about things that seem uh, okay, but perhaps so, so okay. People probably say, I don't see color or I'm colorblind. Um, Edward Kendi even admits in his book how he's been racist. So the sense that, you know, uh, Edward Kendi can be racist, then perhaps I've done things that are racist or currently do things that are racist. So he feels that anti-racist uh, sentiment or whatever is based on humility that, you know, he realized that on reflection that even uh, this black, black dude can be racist, that maybe uh, others could be racist as well. So what do we do? Well, one of the first things folks do is uh, mandatory unconscious bias training or voluntary unconscious bias training. I, I know RSNA actually is, has some modules on unconscious bias training. I've now been asked to modify them because uh, to make a more efficient version of this. Uh, bottom line is everyone has bias and, and sometimes it serves us well, but sometimes it uh, doesn't serve us well or, or our organization. Do you all do that here? or some, to some extent, what, I don't know. We, we can perhaps talk offline, but tell me what you really think. Anyways, I, I uh, 
Howard Ross is, has a, a company that administers unconscious bias training, and uh, they administer these two-hour sessions. And one of my colleagues was jokingly saying, like, if I had a two-hour session on, on unconscious bias, I'd be unconscious. <laughs> I do think you can use two hours for, for whatever you can accomplish more in two hours, but... Um, I think the bottom, I will give you like this two minute version. Bottom line is unconscious bias or everyday bias can, is partially responsible for health disparities. This is a slide from the unconscious bias. This is like the punchline, how to mitigate bias. So they have this kind of nifty chronic uh, pause. And uh, for those of you, it sounds like you do well, uh, mindfulness in your wellness. It's coming. A it's little coming. bit, yeah. <laughs> so a lot of this stuff is actually right out of the mindfulness playbook. It seems to pay attention, acknowledge your assumptions, see, understand your perspective. Um, but there are times when, you know, perhaps when you're making important decisions, you should really kind of question your gut instinctive uh, reaction. Uh, just some shameless self-promotion. We uh, I think that's part of any academic. Uh, when you, when you, I understand you all have to do resident lectures. So you can practice so whatever you've published or presented. Just got to, if you don't self-promote, you need someone who's going to promote. It's kind of un-Asian of me, but <laughs> got to break that stereotype. Well, why is there, I see. Yeah, well, why is it's there. right there. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> I am biased, <laughs> sometimes purposely so. Anyways, uh, th this one actually was generously, mostly written by Richard Gunderman, just saying. But... So some people, uh, this was on Twitter, so I, I used to spend more, a lot of time on Twitter. My wife would say probably too much time, but um, this, this I think is true. Um, <clears throat> Unconscious or implicit bias training is an inadequate way to understand systemic racism and is a low bar to set for med students or any healthcare professional. Um, so yeah, I think. So sometimes we talk about microaggressions. So this is ACGM has generated some content, right? Had a sneak review and scarfed one of these slides. Uh, Chester Pierce, if you talk about microaggression, probably have to acknowledge Chester Pierce. He's an African American a psychiatrist who coined the term in the 70s. And he was kind of contrasting microaggression to <coughs> forms of racism that African Americans would experience. And uh, so here's some more verbiage. Uh, first full, full professor at NGH, and then uh, later on, uh, Chinese American psychologist Daryl Wing Su, who you can actually follow on Twitter, uh, about microaggressions. <clears throat> For those of you who are around in AUR 2016, uh, Brenda Allen uh, was one of the key <laughs> speakers and uh, she she used the analogy of microaggressions like a mosquito bite versus uh, macroaggression, I suppose, you know, like a shark bite. So let's see, let's we have a little video. Let's give it a shot. For people who still don't think that microaggressions are a problem. Oh, you're so well spoken. Oh, just imagine instead of being a stupid comment, a microaggression is a mosquito bite. Ugh, it's a compliment. <laughs> mosquito bites and their itch are one of nature's most annoying features. But if you're only bitten every once in a while. No, where are you really from? Uh, Cleveland. Sure, it's annoying, but it's not that big a deal. The problem is that some people get bitten by mosquitoes a lot more than other people. I mean, a lot more. Whether it's on a date. Oh, your English is so good. Excuse me? Going grocery shopping. You know, everything happens for a reason. I'm just buying apples. Commuting to work. So when are you going to have a baby? Watching TV. We have to keep the red kid's name. It's part of our culture and history. Or just walking down the street with your partner. I couldn't even tell you were gay. 
Mosquitoes seem to pop up everywhere. Do you know John? Do you see me shopping at so my dad? I love here too. And getting bit by mosquitoes every day. Can I touch your hair? Multiple times a day. So pretty. Can I touch your hair? Oh my God. Can I touch your hair? It's annoying. And makes you want to go ballistic on those mosquitoes, which seems like a huge overreaction to people who only get bit every once in a while. It's just a mosquito bite. Who cares? Just another angry black woman. Of course, beyond just being annoying, some mosquitoes carry truly threatening diseases that can mess up your life for years. Astrophysics? Hmm. Maybe you should try this challenging major. Ow. My dreams. And other mosquitoes carry strains that can even kill you. You looked like you was up to trouble, okay? I felt threatened. So next time you think someone's overreacting, just remember, some people experience mosquito bites all the time. You're all so exotic. Wow. And by mosquito bites, we mean microaggressions. For people who still don't think... So um, I actually thought it was interesting, you know, if you ask anyone mm -hmm. how many people die of shark bites every year and how many die of mosquito bites, it's actually mosquito bites, right? Mm -hmm. the, so that's another. Um, just like microaggression, perhaps, I don't know. Okay. Um, microaggressions, if we know about it, you can have, I don't want to, I think I'll postpone. <laughs> What do you think? Cool book. <laughs> <laughs> better interactions with others, uh, better care for our patients. Um, so this kind of gets us into the whole conversation of being a bystander or an ally or so-called upstander. And so there's uh, several kind of routes. One, you could do nothing. Two, you can kind of work things out. And three, you could go to war and by that, I mean report, you know, whatever, report the person to HR or files an office report, that sort of thing. There are probably times that are, are right for, for everything. <coughs> so do nothing. There's a bunch of considerations, whether it's the history of interacting with that individual, sometimes uh, depending on the power gradient of the individuals involved, uh, especially for trainees, it's hard to <laughs> speak up sometimes. Um, junior attendings even sometimes, depending on what's going on, it's hard to speak up. Um, how to kind of decide when your impact will be greatest. And so that's this whole notion of calling in versus calling out. Uh, some uh, calling in is perhaps when you, you hear the, the, any sort of comment that might be inappropriate, then you pull the person aside later and discuss it and it may be less embarrassing, but there are sometimes perhaps where you need to call things out right when it happens, just to you know, show everyone in the room that that's not okay. <clears throat> sometimes it depends on your energy. Sometimes for folks that you just don't wanna deal with, you know, this, you don't have the energy to deal with things <laughs> in there. Um, if sometimes if, you think you're being an ally, but you actually are causing more of a burden to, to your person you think you're being an ally too. So um, you always have to take that into consideration. So one thing I got to do relatively recently, uh, um, Brad Johnson <clears throat> has uh, written two books on allyship mostly in, in terms of uh, being ally for men, how men can be allies to women. And he actually interestingly breaks it down into things you can do personally and things you can do at work and things you can do almost structurally. And so this, guess what one of the personal things is, folks, that men can share more equally with the house chores. I see some nodding of heads and smiles. So yeah, that means doing your fair, fair share of, of household chores, such as laundry. Um, that's one way, if, if you, so hopefully after this, you'll take away some action items. So you'll either volunteer to do more laundry or household chores or volunteer your um, So this is uh, marriage advice that, Peter Ginsburg received, and every now and then it helps to be a little deaf. So 
sometimes you know you can't just engage every potential slight or you know it may not be worth it and you gotta conserve energy save time so sometimes it does help to be a little deaf sometimes i'll even tell things you know to my wife and she'll say dingling just never mind <laughs> and yeah, i think it is tr is true actually we had a recent story with uh maybe i might have a slide another slide so Maya Angelou uh, probably has experienced more than her, had experienced more than her share of microaggressions. Uh, but she's, it's almost stoic advice. You may not control all the events that happen to you, but you can decide not to be reduced by them. Uh, I have a Maya Angelou story I can share offline at some point. Um, sometimes uh, this is actually a a colleague sent this to me after the Atlanta shooting where they, uh, she was just uh, checking in on me um, they, during the, all this AAPI hate. And she says, free, feel free if you kind of talk about it, just want to wish you well. And just kind of sh allyship showing that she's thinking of me, but I don't necessarily have to respond. And, you know, to expect a response, you know, that might be the last thing I want to do that particular day. But that was very, very kind of her. Or Twitter, Twitter direct messaging. That was actually someone I had actually really met in person. So that was kind of cool. <clears throat> um, so sometimes when you're working things out, you may have some of you uh, kind of the management work. I think there's full books on humble inquiry, or if you approach the situation with curiosity, uh, you can just ask a question what did you mean by that? Or you can just, I'm not sure if I heard you correctly, can you repeat what you said? And that may often be good enough to um, defuse the situation, if you will. <laughs> I, I've uh, read one book, so this is probably the only thing I remembered from it. <laughs> and because I'm a MRI person, um, I like that they, what does MRI have to do with microaggression? Well, not so much, but they say when people say something to you, try to interpret it in the most respectful way. So, you know, it, I mean, if you go through life trying to, you know, take offense at everything anyone says, it's like it's not a good way. I don't advise it because you're going to find, you know, some, someone, you're going to be offended by her, so many things. And try to, go through life and so maybe they didn't mean it that way. And even if they do, it's just a better for your, your sanity. And then you may have opportunities to change things as well. So we've talked about uh, call in and call out. This is just an example I've experienced. Uh, so I was at that unconscious bias training. And so uh, a colleague, uh, Cable said, oh, use the expression chink in the armor. And I said, you know, that's kind of like the N word for Asians. And there are dictionary words that, you know, maybe we should avoid if we can. And he actually, oh gosh, and he apologized and was appreciative that I, I made that comment. Uh, another person who works in the diversity space actually asked me, have you been back to Japan? So I could ask that of Yoshimi and Satoshi, I guess, and that would be true. But it, it's kind of that whole thing about perpetual foreigner, right? You don't see me and say, oh, have you been back to Canada? Because that's where I was born. So they say that. But that's, and so Derek Winks, who actually breaks down microaggression <laughs> to different categories, and that's one of them. So in the moment, there's a way to call out uh, microaggressions. There is a uh, person who was a radiology resident at some other institution. He was dressed in scrubs. And he told the story is just in uh, lunch in the cafeteria. But when the cashier saw him, he just points out a spill for him to clean up. And the other people are horrified. And said, he's a doctor, not, a, not the spill cleaning person. And, the cashier apologized, but you know, these are just almost every day, or not every day. I mean, I, I, I have a, a 
person I, I did my vintage training and he's our trauma chief and he would go into a patient's room and, and the patient would like hand him the cafeteria with a tray, right? So, so, you know, I'm happy to take your tray, but I'm here, I'm chief of trauma. And we want to talk about you know, your, how we saved your life last night, you know? <laughs> so anyways, um, certainly, so this is kind of referring to the, the deaf, pretend you're deaf or you don't want to paralyze every conversation um, and I actually saw this book in the waiting room, Foyt Fragility, Fragility. So you have to kind of have a balance. Um, actually, Alan Matsumoto, our, our new, uh, he's going to be, I think he is now currently chair of the board of chancellors. He actually um, told the story at one of his talks. He's, uh, wherever he was at school, I guess there weren't any Asian folks. And then, so somebody just made a comment, oh, you're not from around here or something. And so instead of taking offense, he kind of, yeah, I'm not around, around here, I'm visiting, I'm a student. I'm, and then the, turned out that, you know, by not immediately getting offended, the people he was talking to invited him over for a dinner because, you know, <laughs> not with your family. Well, oh, why don't you come over and have dinner with you? So, you know, and he probably served as a good ambassador. So, you know, you don't, you don't want to just immediately jump and take offense at everything, at every opportunity. Um, this is something that happened. Uh, I was on a call with some AAPR students and somebody said, yeah, they were a student at the front desk and somebody just made this comment to her. No one's ever said that to me. <laughs> but but this, they said this to her and, and she was like, no, kind of at a loss for words. And this actually is, if you spend too much time on social media, you will you'll see this exchange. So Cardi P apparently said, Hennessy is her sister, I guess. I don't, I'm not a somebody, Hennessy is her sister. But then somebody just pointed out that even if you didn't intend to piss people off, you your impact was that you did impact, um, upset people. So sometimes when we make comments, uh, uh, the uh, impact is that we um, upset them and even when we didn't mean to. So we have to kind of uh, acknowledge that and try to keep the conversation going. This is kind of interesting uh, thing about uh, Dolly Parton. Apparently she had a restaurant chain called Dolly Parton's uh, Dixie Stampede. And then she was saying, you know, there's such a thing as innocent ignorance. Many of us are guilty of that. When they said Dixie was an offensive word, well, I don't want to offend anybody. Let's just call it the stampede. As soon as you realize that, you should fix it. Don't be a dumbass. <laughs> That's where my heart is. I would never dream of hurting anybody on purpose. Full disclosure, actually, we all actually went to the Dixie Stampede and saw their little, little show. So. Um, this is kind of a, another Twitter um, vignette, if you will. So apparently this, a surgeon um, asked somebody uh, during a case, presumably API, perhaps, uh, um, where are you from? And, and the, the person kind of, well, like in that little video, they kind of overreacted, if you will, and <laughs> to the authorities, and then he's no longer allowed to work with medical students. You could argue that the medical school didn't handle that too well either, but, um, you know, it, it can be an icebreaker. Where are you from? But if I say, you know, New York City, then when you get to like third or fourth level of questioning, then maybe it's kind of, is that what you do to everyone? Oh, where are you really from? Anyways, but yeah, sometimes I think you can be too sensitive to, um, sadly. So yeah, we, we wrote about this more shameless self-promotion. Um, Marilyn De Benedictus, my, my uh, colleague, did the bulk of this, but uh, let's see. I think we referred to I wrote a letter 
to the other in JACR, and this was the response, and this is what triggered that whole thing. Somebody said I was kowtowing to the status quo, and maybe that he didn't intend to. I actually emailed the guy and said, you know, what's up? And he, I didn't get a response, so maybe the email is no good, who knows? But anyway, kowtowing to the status quo, somebody, a um, non-Asian person my, in my uh, reading room was like, really, that guy had to go there? And, uh, and uh, yeah. So I actually complained to Ruth Carlos and she told me to write this. So, <laughs> kind of. Um, Carolyn actually received this uh, feedback on, on, the, on that piece. The person was actually uh, offended by the piece on microaggression. <laughs> Asian person is offended by the phrase chink in the armor, then we should man up, I suppose. But uh, I think there's a balance. You don't want to be super overly politically correct, but you don't want to just deliberately say things to <coughs> annoy people or, or start a controversy. I guess unless you're with friends, it's, you want to do that on purpose. But anyways, um, so we wrote this, we, we, we talked about this. This is one of the uh, students I was working with and he was just kind of commenting just uh, how many uh, resident like welcome events involve alcohol and you know, you don't have beers with the folks that you know, you're almost felt, made to felt weird and stuff. And so that was, I think one of the things we put in there. And then I used it as a, a way to plug uh, structured interviews. And then I later got this email. The guy who wrote this, he wrote me a, a long, long email. But then he, he was, you know, there's a backlash against DEI. And so this is one of the backlashes. He, he thought this was uh, apologetic pandering and you know, there's all sorts of things. So, yeah, I realize that sentiment's out there and I'd be happy to talk, talk to folks about it. Um, he actually that was bashing structured interviews and just kind of in one fell swoop, but I, I could go into in depth about why that, I think that's a good idea. And that's what you, you, you all use here, for structured interviews. So good for you. Uh, Dan Chande is, uh, one of our colleagues who's chair of the Rankin Ray Diversity Committee. <clears throat> and uh, he, he even says this microaggression training is, is uh, not good enough. Example, but, and I think he's right, just microaggression is, it's good to know about, but perhaps we can do better. Go to war. Um, so these are, uh, I have actually been to Japan just for full disclosure and visited my mother's relatives who said, hey, check out these. So this is one of your relatives. I couldn't understand them so well because I don't really speak Japanese, but from the translation, they said, apologize. So at that moment, I was thinking, wow, I don't think I was the first cross-sectional imager in my family. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I think this was, uh, it could have been used, as you may know, the strategy is to either lop off the head, so that would mean neck imaging, or if you're holding a sword, you lop off the wrist and they're not holding the sword anymore, they just have some, so that would be wrist imaging, so maybe they were involved in wrist and neck imaging. It's an interesting specialty. <laughs> okay, so... Uh, Going to war is reporting things to administration. And sometimes some of these things end up in lawsuits. If you can just Google Den R versus Tulane, you get some gory uh, saga of a uh, program director suing Tulane. Um, and then this is one of our students who during the pandemic was assaulted on her way to Mount Sinai. And so they formed a committee and I'm on the committee and we're trying to figure out what we can do to um, improve safety for, for uh, all the workers. And we've had various incidents where there, people were spit on or 
So the, sadly, it, it's um, not tons of things you can do. We, we distribute whistles. I mean, Andy apparently knew some Brazilian jiu-jitsu or something, and maybe that limited her, her injuries. Yeah, it, it's a thing. So when that kind of pandemic API stuff happened, we there is a at the time it was called Hollaback, and at the time they had bystander uh, upstander training online. Uh, they've morphed into another organization, and now their stuff is behind a paywall. But so I'm just going to give you an executive summary. They talk about five Ds. So if you see something kind of sketchy going on, you can uh, distract them and just you can whatever. If you are creative folks, you can figure out your own way to distract people, but you can say, excuse me, and just you know pretend you want to know about the next stop. <clears throat> Sing your favorite song, I don't know, something. Delegate. So many of us have done CPR training, right? You and one of the first things that, as I recall, is you're supposed to bark out our orders and go beautiful mm -hmm. all night. This. So this, if you notice something like that, you can um, delegate and perhaps have, have the um, clerk, in this case, the clerk call, call for help or whatever. This. Some of these things that, uh, actually entail some risk to yourself, right? You've all heard of stories that if you do say that's inappropriate, leave them alone, then you become the target. So it, it has to, in some ways, has to do with how much risk you're willing to um, take on that day. And I, we've had seen videos of people that try to intervene and then they start wielding the cane or stick on, on the person that, uh, the good Samaritan, if you will. Uh, documenting is with the prevalence of cell phones, um, that, that's uh, important. Um, but afterwards, you should always ask the, you shouldn't just post it on social media afterwards if you have a discussion what they would like to, you to do with the video. I think there's one more delay. Uh, so delay is perhaps after the incident, are you okay? I've actually heard of people that you know, witness incidents and they uh, go to approach the person or, or assume they want something to be done, the person's actually upset at the uh, bystander, well-meaning bystander. So it's very important to actually talk to the victim and say, you know, would you like me to do anything? And if they say yes, then you don't, don't assume that they want you to do something. <laughs> Perhaps they're upset at the perpetrator and they just take it out on you, but at the end of the day, you should probably just ask them what, what they want them. Um, one important thing is uh, some institutions have a racist patient policy. So Mount Sinai had one, one could argue relatively late in the game, 2021, but better late than never. So I don't know if you all have something like that. Um, and that's perhaps one systemic thing you could advocate for. Sometimes, uh, I've heard of stories where, you know, the resident is uh, the racial epithet and uh, then they tell the chief resident that this happened and the chief resident just kind of shrugs. That's probably not a good way to be a supportive chief resident. Um, oh, wow, more, more self-promotion. Um, Chris, Chris Ho uh, took on the bulk of this, the work. He does reference the, uh, the five Ds and, and stuff like that. Uh, so this was something that affected radiology. Well, it kind of affected radiology, but what was the, uh, the deal with using the correction for African-Americans and the EGFR? Does anyone, sometimes I ask people to explain in two sen a sentence or two, what was the net impact? If you use the correction, what would, what would happen? It makes it look like their kidney functions better than what it was. Yes, absolutely. And therefore, what would happen? 
No, they couldn't get on the transplant lists. Right, they're lower on the transplant list and lower on the dialysis list, right? So that's, that's and then for us, we would end up giving uh, something potentially toxic uh, to black people as opposed to non-black people. So, and you could argue whether that's a good thing or are we just being wimps about, you know, not giving data to, to uh, based on GFR. So Mount Sinai, probably I would say in the last five years, but, um, I think that um, it's not just radiologists, but the kidney experts have de decided that it's not a good thing. So most likely your institution's not using it. Unless, do you know? Yeah, that could be a, a minor quality project. You're gonna sign into something. Um, so here's some strategies to mitigate bias. Uh, try to mentor people who aren't like you. This is a cute little, cute article from Harvard Business Review. So there is a strategy. If you sign up, you can get three free articles a month. So you can, three free articles per month per browser. <laughs> Just saying, you know. So, and if you team up, you, you can get probably a ton of free articles. Uh, this is some way, some another way. You can tell that some time ago I had shorter, more, more socially acceptable hair, I guess. Um, so my, I learned about this in the U.S. in New York City. My kid. Uh, Good. And it's one way you can show allyship. And in some ways, you know, sometimes it, you almost feel, um, oh, okay, I, I made a public showing, but at the end of the day, what actually changed. And so sometimes you, you do want to um, use your energy. You don't want to just use all your energy for protesting because then the, the whatever, the, the villain you would say is, is one because okay they made up they shouted in the street but now we can just go back and do what we were doing right so you have to uh, you can show public support but you also have to do things to change change the uh, status quo not count out to the status quo so, anyways. So I have some actually suggested action items for folks in the room. Um, join AAWR so residents can all join for free and join as an ally. So that AAWR actually changed their name to, I don't know, I probably should have written it out because I'll mess it up, but Association, American Association for Women in Radiology. And so that it made it easier for men to join. And I'm a, I'm a card carrying member. Um, and then there's other organizations, the National Medical Association, which is, you all know the history of National Medical Association. Why did it even form? So National Medical Association is a black African-American medical association. So at a there was a time when the AMA would not allow black physicians to join. We talk about systemic issues, right? And so they said, okay, never mind, we're forming our own association. And that exists to this day. Uh, this year, I think they're meeting in New York City, and they have a section on radiation, radiology and radiation oncology, and that they have a small booth at uh, RSNA every year. But yeah, it's a, like a wild history, right? Um, radiology Health Equity Coalition, I, you know, sometimes the, there's a lot of help. Uh, you could argue the main reason we do DEI stuff is that we want to promote health equity. Sometimes the health equity work kind of falls, is almost a natural extension of DEI work. <coughs> a simple thing you could use is use pronouns with, uh, for allyship. Um, you might think, and, and I've heard stories where people say, just thank you, thank you for doing that. I think when I, I put pronouns, I believe I put pronouns in my title page and somebody commented, oh, you did that. So, yep, I did it. Um, one thing is uh, limited English 
proficiency is a, a big thing. And um, so if you can do interpreter services, I think that, that would be a cool, cool thing. Say for, I don't know what the, what's the main uh, non-English language in Salt Lake? Spanish. Spanish. So is, if anyone has, does medical Spanish. So every institution has their own rules. It used to be Mount Sinai. You, you had to take a Saturday course and, and then eventually somebody, we had like a couple of residents that actually took the course and, and uh, I thought they seemed happy about it. And I, I think the patients were happy that, you know, if you're doing interventional, sometimes um, it's nicer when you can actually talk to the person and things get lost in the translation, I think for some of the medical terms. And so back then I was a PD, so I would say, you know, if you did this, you spent your Saturday with your compensation day, not to put any ideas in there. <laughs> um, and then whatever internal charge there was, we, we covered charge. I think they changed the system now. So you, you don't want to just, um, if you're not officially certified and you, you do interpretation, though, you couldn't get into trouble, right? So you have to take that in mind. Um, there's a PD checklist uh, I went over with your PD. So that's um, one thing interesting. Do you all know SDGs or SDGs? So this is a, a thing. I, I live actually pretty close to the UN. And so they have all these banners. And my, my kid is uh, on the phone talking about SDGs. And it's sustainable development goals. So there's an intersection with uh, DEI work and sustainability. And um, many of the sustainability development goals, they have this ambitious thing where we have to make progress on many of these goals by 2030. But many of these are, are very interrelated to DEI, gender equality, number five, and uh, sustainability, you know, climate action and stuff like that. So that's one thing. Some, some uh, departments have a sustainability committee and, and just trying to figure out what we can do. And it's a hot topic at many of the meetings these days, <clears throat> trying to figure out uh, what we can do, how we can make a difference in that space. One of our, our colleagues, Reed O'Marie, who is a former chair at Vanderbilt, he's dedicated this whole uh, sabbatical year to figuring out what he, we can do. So we're looking for some guidance from him. And that's it. Meditation. <laughs> That's which one I am not. Right. Um, this is a, so this is a QR code. So if you're on LinkedIn, you can scan it and you can find it. Omar Arigato. <laughs> any question to Dr. Yeah, happy, happy to answer any questions. <laughs> is that awesome yet? Uh, I for the racist patients, what were the actual steps to take if that's 